Hello, uh, my name is Paul Stockdale from ABCPE. Welcome. Uh, this is the site, of course, where we make VCE physical education as easy as ABC. Today I want to talk about fatigue and recovery. I particularly want to channel in on the third cause of fatigue there, thermoregulatory fatigue. You can see that the word fatigue leads us to the causes that we need to know. Um, one being fuel depletion, two being accumulation of metabolic byproducts, and finally the one we're focusing on today thermoregulatory fatigue. I want to start with a video of a young Scottish athlete, Callum Hawkins, who competed in the marathon uh, in the Gold Coast, in fact, in 2018 at the Commonwealth Games. Incredibly hot, stifling conditions, and poor Callum didn't fare so well. Let's have a look. On for the last probably kilometre and a half, he's been all over the road. These are really worrying moments for Callum Hawkins. He's just collapsed. And I think the dehydration and the weather and the savage pace he produced at the start might be getting to him. He's desperately trying to carry on here. Callum, unfortunately, has got himself in a situation where he may not even finish. Oh, this is such a shame for Callum Hawkins. He is so brave. So you can see the effect that thermoregulatory fatigue had on the Scottish athlete Callum Hawkins and the reason is that the body really is sensitive um, to core body temperature changes. We like to bet 37, um, anything too far from that and we really are in trouble like Callum. So look, I want to talk about the ways that we get rid of heat um, and one of the ways is that we radiate heat into the cooler environment. Um, of course the environment has to be cooler um, so it needs to be less than 37 degrees for that to work properly. And the other way is evaporative cooling via sweat. Uh, and again, we're assuming that the conditions allow for that, that it's not too humid. And you can see that the Gold Coast at that time was hot, it was humid. And so um, basically poor Callum had a massive reduction of blood to the muscle that reduced the oxygen supply to the muscles and he had to slow down significantly. Let's begin with that first one, that radiation, and that is allowed through vasodilation and vasoconstriction. That's a process where our blood vessels get wider, dilate, or smaller, that is they constrict. So the diameter of the blood vessels can change, and that's because there's smooth muscle in those blood vessels. So when I start to exercise, I want blood going to the muscles, and so the Blood vessels that go to the muscles will vasodilate, that is they get wider. And the blood vessels going to other parts of the body will get smaller, that is they'll vasoconstrict. Um, unfortunately when it's hot, uh, the body will prioritize getting rid of heat over, the, over exercising. So you're trying to exercise and you want this sort of thing going on, your body's saying, well I've got to get rid of heat. And so the blood vessels that go to the skin will vasodilate and the blood vessels going to the muscle will vasodilate constrict. Now whenever we mention vasoconstriction and vasodilation, please mention each other. Right? They're like Bert and Ernie, they're never seen apart. If, if you've got one, you've got the other one. The biggest problem here is that less blood now is going to the muscles because you're vasodilating to the skin. You're getting rid of heat, great, but now you've got less blood going to the muscle. That blood usually carries oxygen for aerobic ATP production. If you've got less of it, you've got less aerobic ATP production you've got to slow down. To prove that this happens, anyone who's ever exercised and their face goes red, oh, happens to me all the time, that's proof that what's happening is that those blood vessels to the skin of your face are vasodilating, and blood, of course, is red. So we've also got evaporative cooling, and that is um, enabled via sweat. So the blood that's going closer to the skin will release fluid. It's blood plasma. The liquid part of your blood gets released and goes through your pore, the pores of your skin, sits on your skin, and that will evaporate. And that process of evaporation will cool the skin. And the blood coming past the skin gets cool, and you cool down. Um, but again, it's got some issues. That is, we're losing blood plasma. So as we lose the liquid part of the blood, we get the blood's getting thicker, which means it's harder to pump around the body. Um, also, you've got less blood volume. So that will decrease your stroke volume, decrease your cardiac output. All of that means that there's less blood and therefore less oxygen going to the muscle where it's needed for aerobic ATP production. So you've got to slow down. So let's summarize what happens. 
we exercise. This generally happens in long duration events on hot, humid days, and you see the questions actually lead you towards that direction. So our muscles produce heat, it increases our core body temperature, so we try to get rid of that heat by redistributing blood to the skin and away from the muscles via that process that I explained. Sweat gets secreted and we start to lose our blood volume. We now have less oxygenated blood delivered to our muscles. It leads to a decreased rate of aerobic ATP production, so we have to slow down. Or we increase reliance on anaerobic glycolysis system, and of course that produces hydrogen ions, and we have to slow down. In terms of uh, exam questions, here's a great one from 2011. I'll give you a moment to have a look Answer it. So what is the most likely physiological cause of Bruno's fatigue? Well, they've told you that temperature. So we've got two choices. It's either elevated body temperature or dehydration. Now we need to drill into the physiological process for part B um, and explain why Bruno has slowed down. Now I tend to think of this in terms of, well, what's the cause? Why is it affecting us physiologically? And then how is it affecting performance? We already know that Bruno's slowed down. We already know sort of that it's elevated body temperature. So we've got to find three marks here. So the what is elevated body temperature dehydration, but we've already given that. So now we need to talk about, well, the body's going to redirect blood and it's going to sweat and decrease blood volume. Well, why does this affect the performance? Well, it'll reduce the amount of blood and oxygen going to the muscle. Therefore, the rate of ATP or aerobic ATP production will decrease and the athlete will need to slow down or increase their reliance on the anaerobic glycolysis system and accumulate hydrogen ions anyway. So there's a good three mark answer. And if you were getting three marks for that, you can see that you're in the top 15% of the state. Another um, more recent question Explain, um, sorry, road cycling. Again, they've pointed you in the direction. This is a long event, four hours and 50 minutes, completed in 29 degrees Celsius. One way in which the body regulates its temperature, so you could go either evaporative, cooling, or radiation, doesn't matter. But the second part of this, and I would suggest that we bracket the second part of every question. So the A, B, C, P, E, the B stands for bracket the second part of the question. The effect it has on performance. So body redistributes blood from the muscle to the skin. We also sweat. I've actually given you both reasons. Um, this reduces blood and oxygen supply to the muscle, thus decreases the rate of aerobic ATP production, causing the athlete to slow down. Now, a lot of people missed the second mark, and I'll guarantee it was because they forgot to say what that did to performance. It decreases performance. It reduces performance. It causes the athlete to slow down. How did you go? Well, thanks for watching. Uh, my name's been Paul Stockdale. Um, for any other information uh, on online learning resources, please go to our website, www.abcpe.com.au. I'll see you next time. Thanks.